The Curbsiders are now partnering with VCU Health Continuing Education to offer CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. So we're back with another episode of Curbsiders Women in Medicine Edition. Hey guys, I'm here with Shreya and Justin. Yeah, Shreya's hey, are back. Shreya's <laughs> in the house. Shreya's in the house. Oh. Justin's in the house. Yeah, were you were you at our was it ACP or S gym where we created Shreya's? What was first last year? But we got yeah, we got nervous and wanted to have a joint nickname and immediately yelled Shreya's. <laughs> and it stuck. It sounds like a snack. Yeah, like a like a yeah. shrabbit dog. <laughs> um, Leah, tell us about the episode for today. Okay, this episode is amazing. Um, I can't wait to listen to it myself. So this episode, we're talking about COVID-19 and the role it's played on gender inequity. We have two incredible guests. We're spanning both the coasts, um, Kelly Graham, Dr. Kelly Graham and Dr. Lakshmi Santosh. And you'll hear, I think, both of their kids. They each have children and you can hear them in the background, which we thought was appropriate for this episode and maybe on reflection appropriate for every episode because this is all, all happening in our free time. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. Usually we would pause the audio listeners at home and, and say, oh, wait for that ambulance to go by. Wait for the, the, you know, grandfather clock that kidney boy had to stop. But, you know, it was just very real to the conversation we're having yeah. today. Yeah. So Dr. Kelly Graham, MD, MPH. She is an academic general internist who serves as the director of ambulatory training and the director of the primary care track for the internal medicine residency program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She received training in health services research from the Harvard Combined General Medicine Research Fellowship and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And Shreya, do you want to introduce Dr. Santosh? Sure. Dr. Lakshmi Santosh specializes in pulmonary and critical care medicine with a focus on medical education. She serves as the Associate Program Director for the Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine Fellowship at UCSF. She's also the co-founder and co-director of UCSF's WILD program, which stands for Women in Leadership Development. It's a longitudinal program for women residents and fellows focused on leadership training. Uh, and on her free time, she's also now uh, another hat, uh, a new, the new director of UCSF's post-acute uh, COVID clinic called Optimal Clinic. Um, and for those of you who are not on Twitter and have not seen, um, she's also a co-author of a very uh, recently published McSweeney piece called, quote unquote, thanks for assuming I'm not the faculty and that my faculty is male. Text from four women ICU physicians across the country caring for COVID patients. Uh, it's great. I highly recommend everyone check it out. Pew, 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 pew. Awesome. Welcome. Hi, Kelly and Lakshmi. Thanks for so much for coming on the show. We're so excited to have both of you here. Really delighted to be here. Thanks so much. So let's start. We're going to start with some rapid get to know you questions. Um, let's start with the one liner. So maybe Kelly, can you go first? Um, can you give us a one liner to describe yourself? Sure. I'm a 38-year-old um, academic internist that has my dream job in Boston, um, combining uh, GME work with residents, uh, health services research, and primary care. And I am currently homeschooling, so I'm also working on my elementary school education degree. <laughs> Is, that part of the dream? Is that part of the dream job? It is. It's the quadruple threat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How old are your kids? They are nine, seven, and six. So just old enough to actually need a teacher and not old enough to be able to go to Zoom meetings with their teachers. <laughs> uh, all right, Lakshmi, let's hear your one-liner. So I would say I'm a 34-year-old woman, physician, generalist, and specialist. I have a long history of chocolate dependence and... I'm currently presenting for this podcast with two daughters under three in the next room. 
That's awesome. You guys are, uh, I'm excited to hear your guys' perspectives on things even more now. Um, can you tell us uh, if you uh, have a gender awakening moment or a women in medicine gender awakening moment? Lakshmi, maybe I'll start with you. There really are so many moments, Shreya. It's hard to pick one. Some memorable ones that come to mind is running to a rapid response as a senior resident and having my tall male medical student being addressed as the code leader. Of course, we have our microaggressions from working at the VA hospital. And then another image that flashes in my mind is being the lone skirt suit on the interview trail for Palm Critical Care Fellowship. So I could go on, but those are just a few images. That's great. Kelly, how about you? Any gender awakening moments that really stuck out for you? Yeah, this one's going to be hard for me to tackle rapidly because um, I think it's a really big, beautiful question. Um, but I'll do my best to summarize quickly. Um, I think it would have been sometime in the fall of 2016. I was just rounding out the last chapter of like 30 years of education um, on the stage at the Harvard School of Public Health. And I had just had two children, one year apart, Adam and Maeve. Um, So I was trying to decide what to do. My mentor and I decided it was probably a good idea to take something called a transitional year where I would work at a reduced capacity, finish up my research, work on my job talk, and apply for a K award. That was the plan. And then my life took a really sharp turn. Um, And in the span of about six months, um, Adam was diagnosed with a developmental disorder. Um, Maeve had sepsis twice, and we learned she had an immune deficiency. And I found out I was pregnant with my third son, Patrick, which was not planned. So um, here I was with three children under three, managing two very significant crises. And so I just sort of held on to my job description for another year. Um, And during that year, um, the really expensive Boston suburb that we had invested in, um, we learned that the public schools were not meeting Adam's needs. So he was placed at home by the school. And I was left with nine months of kindergarten to figure out just on my own. Sound familiar to the pandemic? (laughs) Um, So I spent that nine months uh, with a really grueling situation. I was up every morning at five, working till seven, homeschooling till nine uh, with two toddlers on the floor. Um, Then I would dash off to work and we could only afford the nanny, nanny until like three. So my husband would come in at three and we did this on repeat for a long time and I I remember that just being the most exhausting difficult year of my life Um, and that includes a lot of exhausting difficult years Um, and I really experienced it as a personal failure I felt terrible it was the year I didn't meet my clinical RVUs my research was delayed Um, and It was also the year I kind of decided there was too much unpredictability in life to pursue a full-time investigator role, at least at that moment. So um, I remained at 50% another year and um, just had to kind of work from there. And the moment of awakening came actually once everything settled down. And I realized um, it wasn't that I needed to run harder or faster down the beaten path. It was really that I had to create an entirely new path, that the systems and structures that were built years and decades before me just were never going to work for me and my family. And so um, the following year really became a journey in figuring out how to design that path. And with that came incredible perspective um, for me through lived experience on gender equity issues in medicine in particular, motherhood in medicine. And um, having had to develop these systems, these agile work life systems to make my life work has given me incredible skills as a mentor, um, an incredible perspective. So it ended up being a silver lining, but um, it just took a long time to get there. That's nuts. And that's such a a good story for, I think, today, given uh, (laughs) what we're talking about with COVID being one of these unanticipated shots to career path and life path. And it's encouraging that there was some silver lining that, that you pulled from it and some lasting positive benefits that uh, I think we're all hoping that COVID also uh, maybe has some positive benefits. 
One of the questions that I always like to ask uh, is always about advice rece- uh, given or advice received and how that has um, affected your career. And specifically, as a woman in medicine, could, could you each kind of give an example of, of advice that maybe you would give your, your younger self um, about being a woman in medicine? Sure. I think that um, I feel like my identity as a woman in medicine was really for- formed at UCSF during my internship and residency where I began to just embrace all of my different identities. And so I would tell my younger self, my medical student self, who is quite a bit different, to just embrace those multiple identities and not really fear what other people think. And it's at UCSF where I learned that you can wear dresses and skirts and flats and colorful nail polish and cardigans. And you can wear kind of whatever you want as long as it's professional and people still take you seriously as a young woman physician that was a big contrast to where I went to medical school. And I felt very supported in my identity as a woman in medicine at UCSF where I learned some of those lessons and I wish I had internalized some of that a little bit earlier in my career and not have been as afraid. Um, I, would, I would probably tell her to beware of advice in general. Um, one of the biggest rabbits you have to catch, I think somewhere in that really vulnerable place between a couple years out from training and hitting the peak of kind of where you want to be is that a lot of people give you bad advice and they're wrong. Um, And um, figuring out how to surround yourself with a circle of people who understand you and your work and can put it into context and help you guide your decisions, but not make them for you. Um, And I think that's mentoring is really about reframing questions for people. It's not really about providing a lot of answers. And so that that has been incredibly important for me. Um, I would also tell her that she's not a failure, um, that this moment would be her one of her greatest teachers and that those are the things you learn the most from, I think, when you form your identity in medicine and that while her mother's generation um, sort of blew down the door um, of interpersonal gender bias, um, her generation would have to do the harder, invisible, pervasive work of learning how to live in the house with everyone and uh, rearranging the furniture. Um, And that's really the issue of structural bias. It's, It's sort of the invisible cousin to interpersonal bias and it's kind of our next task i think um both as women and as uh, racial minorities so um a lot of work to be done um and that there's a great power in naming um things that are invisible i'm glad i'm glad both of you guys are on today and we can kind of make explicit some of those invisible things um oh this is great why don't we um do a quick round of pick of the wick but wow, pick up the weeks. <laughs> um, it's late at night. My Indian accent comes out uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, Leah, do you have a pick of the week? Okay. So, sure. I saw the pick of the week that you're going to pick. Um, so I decided to go in the opposite direction in terms of being frivolous. So I recently bought on Amazon a paint by sticker book, which is basically, the as it best. sounds, you t- You just, yeah, you just take these tiny little stickers and put together these beautiful, they're vintage posters. We'll put it in our show notes. It is one of the most relaxing activities that I've ever (laughs) done. It is so fun. And you can't check your phone and you can't check Twitter because you're so focused. And in fact, my husband, he is really into um, remote control cars. So he has all these like tiny tools. So he gave me this tweezers so that I can accurately put down the stickers. <laughs> Highly That's recommend awesome. it while, while relaxing. You need night. it. You need it for the, the, all the anxieties and uncertainties that COVID brings. So exactly. Awesome. Yeah. So that's mine. What's yours? Um, well, mine was on the heavier side, as you alluded to. I wanted to shout out a woman in medicine that I've been meaning to shout out for so long. Um, she's a big person in SGYM, uh, Dr. Giselle Corbe Smith, and she has a podcast called a Di- it's called a diverse kind of leader. I think it's DKL leader is um, another thing that it's on on Twitter and Instagram. And basically, she interviews diverse leaders either in like various public health, healthcare, academic. Pot- 
positions and really kind of captures what are their lessons um, on being a diverse leader and what are some actionable tools to navigate it. Um, highly recommend that. I feel like I learned something new every time I listen to one of her episodes. Justin, you want to go with your pick of the week? Sure, I can do one. Um, you know, the first thing that came to my mind in thinking of one was I rewatched the documentary 13th on Netflix that I think a lot of people have seen, especially with everything uh, going on recently with a lot of the racial injustice. And it's just such a well-done documentary that has such superstars, Michelle Alexander, um, Brian Stevenson, Cory Booker, a lot of people that I look up to a lot in correctional medicine. And um, it's just something that everyone should see at some point, I think, especially given the context, all the more reason and motivation to go watch it now. 13th. Yeah. Kelly, uh, what's your pick of the week? So Dr. Kimberly Manning wrote a beautiful piece in the Journal of Hospital Medicine. Um, I see everyone nodding. It was really, really outstanding. Um, and um, I think I think everybody should read it in this moment. And then I'm also binge watching Co- or listening to Conan O'Brien's podcast, um, Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. It's hilarious. <laughs> he he, he um, interviews comedians. And so it's like, an, and he takes a long time with them. And so like, while I'm cleaning my house, I'm listening to it and laughing. And my kids think I have like a, a new fascination with cleaning supplies because <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing so hard. Um, That's it's amazing. wonderful. Awesome. Lakshmi, what's your pick of the week? I think sticking with the theme, if you love podcasts, The Nocturnist is, has always been a fabulous mm-hmm. podcast highlighting voices in healthcare. And they're starting a new podcast start by our own UCSF's own Dr. Ashley McMullen highlighting black voices in healthcare. And she is such a force of nature that I know it's going to be incredible. So I can't wait to check that out. For a frivolous pick of the week, I would say that my shelter in place appreciation for ice cream delivery, I feel like that's just not as stigmatized anymore. Oh no, I'm not doing it. Where are you delivering from? Maybe I should do that. Oh, Smitten Kitchen is what I have to recommend for the Bay Area. The best texture. I don't think we have ice cream delivery in New York. So Shreya, there there are some outstanding Boston places and the interns routinely order it on call. So you will find out soon about those. JP Licks. It comes in sty- <laughs> yeah, it comes in styrofoam cups and it's cold still. It yeah, it's is. Telling a pregnant person about ice cream now I'm like, ah. <laughs> I, it never, Sorry. Same, same here, it never dawned at me to have ice cream delivered. You, I'm going to gain like 30 more oh, pounds about best. pregnancy. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. The only ice cream I've had delivered is Go Puff, like uh, Ben and Jerry's from 7-Eleven. But uh, it is also <laughs> a backup option for you, Shreya, if you find nothing else. Thank and you. Ben and Jerry's great advocates for racial justice. So yeah, yes. you can Tied feel all, good. It all comes oh. back together. Yeah. <laughs> nice. All, all right, right Treya, should we um, get started? Do you want to read the case? Sure, sure. So yeah, so today we're going to be highlighting Dr. Beth Blackwell, our favorite Cashlack Women Medicine mascot, and her challenges during the COVID pandemic. So. Uh, Dr. Blackwell, um, today, I feel like she she goes through different phases in our episodes, but um, today she's an early career assistant professor and clinician educator, and she's now been promoted to assistant program director of her internal medicine residency. So yay, uh, Dr. Blackwell. But um, in mid-March, obviously, her region uh, was doing the shelter in place with COVID, and she started doing monthly or mostly uh, video visits from home. Uh, she, Beth is also a young mother of two children under five, so she's juggling child care in addition, in addition to um, patient care, as well as academic responsibilities, and it's getting pretty tough for her. So I just want to open it up to you guys. Um, Kelly and Lakshmi, does this sound familiar to you? Um, what's it been like for you guys and uh, maybe some of your colleagues uh, who are women in medicine? Yeah, this this does sound familiar. And, and Justin, you hit right on a point after um, my rapid fire answer or my long answer to a rapid fire question. Um It was really strange for for my family. I mean, my life looks exactly like Dr. Blackwell's right now. Um, But for my family, it was almost like we were going through a second wave of our pandemic that happened five years ago. (laughs) And so we were flipping the switch back to on, on like all of the crisis management stuff that we learned um, over the years. Um, So that was a little bit weird for me. 
I felt oddly prepared to do it. And um, when I looked around me at my colleagues, they looked like I did five years ago, scrambling like with an, a, just an impossible situation. And um, they're, they're going through a lot of very, very painful situations right now. Um, they are um, being asked to um, find emergency child care. Um, the child care is unreliable and difficult to find. One friend had two nannies quit because they didn't want to work for a doctor. They felt their personal safety was um, at risk doing that. And that felt strange for her, I think, being somebody who cares so much about other people's safety. Um, another uh, friend has shipped her children to New Hampshire to be with her grandparent, their grandparents and hasn't seen them for two months except on Zoom. The daycare's um, slots are extremely hard to find. And so I think what's happening is uh, a lot of colleagues are in this really difficult state of moral distress where they have um, this ask from their institution to be on the front lines of the pandemic. And I think all of us in general medicine and in critical care medicine, emergency department medicine, were sat down and told, like, we have to work right now. Like, there's no choice. We have to, you know, do, we have to do this work and we expect you to do this work. Um, and that's, that's the message that we all had from our institutions. And then from our community around us, our childcare community, there was just a slammed shut door. Um, and then there was complete silence about it. Nobody's talking about it. Nobody's um, in the leader in the leadership roles in the country at the state level are having an open dialogue about what that means for people who have to hold these two um, issues and try to resolve them. Um, and you know, it, I think that that for me that's been actually the most difficult part is that silence. Because you can't solve problems collectively if you don't name them and you don't um, bring them out into the light and, and have open discussion about them. Um, and I'm also finding myself in a position to be able to advise people about like how to, how to do some of this. Um, and I have a lot of mentees anyways, and so they're, they're calling. They're, they're in tears. They're, they're really in distress. Um, and it was actually hard for me to help them solve some of the problems that they were facing, um, particularly those who were on the front line and those who had pregnancies, vulnerable kids at home. And I ended up consulting an ethicist about it because it was so difficult and um, doing some reading that, you know, I'd, I'd turned to in the past for my own in my own life and um, came up with a couple of constructs that I've been working with, but one day I found myself just like Googling the Hippocratic Oath. And <laughs> it was like a, it was, I was going into a rabbit hole. And I pulled up the old version and the new version. And I was struck by the lack of a woman or mother's perspective in that edict. Um, almost like it's uh, the entryway into this field is incredibly biased to begin with. And you take it when you're like in your 20s and, you, you know, you're, you can still overcome or at least think you're overcoming some of those things. Um, and I was particularly struck by the um, there's a call to protect your predecessor's family. And they, it's actually through teaching them medicine. And um, I thought I, that's just such a deep irony to me because I know that if we had been there writing it, we would have said something about the fact that we need to take care of each other so that we can take and take care of our families so that we can go and do this high risk work. Um, and so that just really stung me. And, and, and I, I think I text messaged Shreya at that point and said, <laughs> <laughs> we have to rewrite this thing. Um, but We'll yeah, write a, a cash lack version of the Hippocratic <laughs> Oath. The Blackwell Oath. Yes. The Blackwell Oath. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Lakshmi, how are things on your end? So much of what you said, Kelly, and what Dr. Blackwell is going through is so resonant with me. I felt like that moment when I was attending in the COVID ICU and pumping milk for my infant, I felt like this is a women in medicine pandemic struggle moment right here and coming home, 
rushing to just strip all my clothes out and go straight to the shower so before they touch me so that I don't dare contaminate them while I can hear them both crying for me is that is something that is unforgettable. And, you know, today is a less intense day, but like you said, Kelly, research meetings in the morning and Zoom, seeing patients and precepting fellows this afternoon, rushing to pick up both the kids from, from child care and coming home for this and trusting that my husband will feed and entertain them for this hour. And I recognize that I have immense privilege in having an amazing spouse who is a hashtag he for she all the way through and childcare during this pandemic. It wasn't always the case. We kind of went in cycles. The first few weeks we said, we're going to alternate days and do the childcare and do the work. And that quickly fell apart after a few weeks. Then we had one of the furloughed daycare teachers come to our house for childcare and quickly realized that she was going to large family gatherings, which was not exactly congruent with social distancing from my perspective. And so we bit the bullet and sent them to a different hospital affiliated childcare than the ones that we usually attend, which was an adjustment for all of us. And it has been great. And just like those little micro decisions I've been making during these times, I think women are making daily, if not hourly calculations, these little micro and macro decisions. And one of the things that comes up when I'm talking to trainees and mentees, as Kelly says, is letting go of this immense mom guilt and acknowledging these different roles that we're expected to play now. You're supposed to be a physician, an educator, a researcher, a household manager, a Zoom homeschool teacher. And I also wanted to say explicitly that a lot of the rhetoric that uh, we're seeing in the newspaper, et cetera, is about physician mothers or moms in medicine, but the struggle of moms in medicine and women in medicine should not necessarily be conflated and that women who are not parents still disproportionately bear caregiving responsibilities impact, whether that's elderly parents, other family members, sick family members, partners with pre-existing conditions, pregnancy, as we've talked about, and more. And the pandemic is really exacerbating gender inequities. And I love Kelly's framework of the Hippocratic Oath. And I was thinking about what framework to give to trainees. And I thought that for me, the three P's are in play. I'm an internal medicine nerd and mnemonic lover through and through. And so I'm going to say that the three P's are partners, patients, and panels. And just to briefly describe them. So for partners, I am hearing stories of multiple women physicians, colleagues, doing things like taking their Zoom meetings from the bathroom because their spouses or their phone, their partner's phone call is more important or pays the bills. And I'm seeing physician women colleagues taking on a lot more mental load during the pandemic, uh, doing their day job as well as coordinating, like you said, physically logging into the Zoom for the kids, uh, meal prep, things like that. So there's a lot of logistical efforts that I'm seeing with my women colleagues disproportionately shoulder. And there's a lot of ample research that we know on the motherhood penalty. I was talking to Trey about this versus the fatherhood benefit. And that's documented in the economics literature that women returning from leave, maternity leave, get a pay cut, whereas men returning from leave will often have a halo effect and get a pay raise over time. And I see that dynamic play out in the pandemic with I will have my toddler screaming off camera and be judged for being unprofessional or having too much on my plate. Whereas a male colleague's child who crawls into his lap is viewed as, oh, that's so nice. You're such a good family man. So that's P, partners. Uh, The second P is patience. And I see that we are, women disproportionately are represented in clinician educator tracks or pure clinical roles. And the clinical burden of the pandemic is falling on that exact population. So women are overrepresented being asked to, like Kelly said, step up, take more shifts, take more weeks, take more night shifts, build new clinics, see more patients in clinics. And in some hospitals, fortunately not mine, actually getting pay cuts, fired, hiring freezes, losing benefits. And that is further exacerbating a gender pay gap, which we know Dr. Blackwell gets paid less than her male counterpart, despite the evidence showing that she has better patient outcomes in study after study. So that's the P for patients. And the final P is panels. And I think that that word for me is a surrogate for other educational or service activities. 
which are typically rest at, less recognized in academic medicine. So I see a disconnect where I told you that women are stepping up disproportionately clinically, yet I'm seeing more manals, all male panels than, than ever before. And I think in the pandemic times, people are going to move things quickly, build things quickly, and will rely on their old models of expertise. Well, they'll call upon that senior Caucasian male faculty member who is an expert, rather than taking to the time to say, who all are qualified and who might be a diverse group of panelists, who all would want this opportunity to speak and build their CV without thinking necessarily thoughtfully or deliberately about these. And I see women taking on a lot of committee service roles, organizing events, volunteerism, rapidly shifting clinical guidelines. And then senior male leaders often are the ones getting that visibility and that credit and the accolades. So when the impacts of these three Ps, your partners, your patients, and your panels collide, I think that affects women physicians disproportionately, whether that is, and, and the women suffer, whether that's from kind of like you said, research productivity, sleep, sanity, your own well-being. But there is hope, and I'm excited that in the rest of the hour, it's not all dire and that we can use some strategies to actually concretely help overcome these barriers. Yeah, I think that's really well said. And uh, it, it's nice also to, you know, like you said, put a name or um, uh, maybe tell you said kind of putting a name to some of the issues. And I think reverting back to old practices of the old white guy panels and things is something that would possibly go unnoticed sometimes unless uh, uh, people are vocalizing it and calling it out. And I think that's good. I, you know, I'd like to go on a little bit too and talk about uh, what other um, gender inequality problems has the pandemic really um, exacerbated. So I know there's a couple examples, but uh in general, in medical education, in some of the issues that are known as far as gender inequality, how has this pandemic made things potentially even worse? Can I just say one other thing too? Of course, of course. Um, Lakshmi um, mentioned mental load, and I just want to pause and name what that is because it's so important, and I'm, I I want to see everyone's head bobbing and as I say this other than just mine and Lakshmi's. <laughs> Um, mental load is, there's another term that's slightly different called emotional labor. It's the, in, it's this invisible mental logistical planning that, that women are constantly calculating and micro deciding about all day. It's, I, I give the best example. It's the fact that I know precisely when all of my children's socks need to be replaced. That's crazy, right? Like why, why is that, you know, happening up here? It's because it needs to happen but also I'm the only one that's thinking about it. And so this is a common dynamic that play out in partnerships where, where women make up half of the partnership and um, it's exhausting. It's, it's, you might be on paper doing the same amount of work, but there's this additional paragraph that's invisible and left out because it has to do with this mental load. And I, I encourage you to write those things down on a task list that you share like you run a business with your with your partner. Um, I started writing things down like I'm going to think about when the socks need to be replaced, and then I that's one of my tasks, and it, e- it ends up evening out the labor when you when you name it and when you make it visible. I just had to say that because I think that is becoming an enormous problem right now um, because there's more mental load to run a homeschool, to run a daycare center, to run an elder care center, all of those things in addition to our routine lives. There is actually an author invented this card game based on this called Fair Play. Fair Play. Is, yes, <laughs> Eve Rodsky. I was just looking it up. Eve Rodsky has a book called Fair Play, which comes with a card game where you literally do what Kelly says to, to just equalize or at least make more equitable that mental load where it includes all those micro tasks like who cuts their baby's toenails? Spoiler alert, it's me. And so you actually itemize those tasks and it's in the form of a card game, you know, to make it fun over a glass of wine or whatever. And you actually will say who is doing what really concretely and granularly. And I definitely encourage people to, if not, like Kelly said, write it down. If you want to use this tool and book and blame Eve Rodsky or credit Eve Rodsky, I think it's a great way to 
explicitly talk about that mental yeah. illness. So fair play by me, Brodsky. I'm going to get that from my husband for Father's Day. Great <laughs> idea. Great idea. <laughs> future, Brilliant. Future, idea. future Father's Day, our first present together. <laughs> Anyways, Justin, um, so you were asking about um, anything you, – you guys named a bunch of things in terms of things that have worsened the pandemic. Anything else that, that really comes to your mind that we should highlight um, that have been worsened uh, in this pa- pandemic and showing us about gender equity? So there's a really interesting um, construct called um, Two Pandemics, One Response um, that the United Nations beautifully laid out um, – And it gets to this issue that um, we have had pandemics of um, structural racism and structural gender bias. Those pandemics are centuries old and continue. And now we have another pandemic in the form of uh, an infectious disease colliding with those pandemics. And those are your two pandemics. And then the, the singularity of our response just makes it exacerbates and lays bare these other pandemics and and can make them worse. And that's why we're seeing our black and brown patients bear the burden of incidence and mortality, um, why we're seeing gender inequities deepen during the pandemic. So um, something, a, a crisis will make the things that are wrong, wronger, and the things that are right, righter. Um, and that's what I have found with all crises in life. That's just the truth, right? So the things that were falling apart and not working will get worse. Um, so that's one thing that I would introduce us all to think about as a concept. Um, the other one is, um, one of my favorites. It's called the breadwinner homemaker bias. And this is a bias that exists in our society. And it's naming the fact that most of the structures that we operate in our society, um, come with this implicit bias that there is somebody at home full-time managing the family and somebody at work full-time who's a breadwinner and that is an outdated family structure Um, it's actually not even economically stable to do that anymore in most cities Um, and yet you will once you see it and you will not be able to unsee it it's why the school day ends at 2 50 p.m right like come on who ends their work day at 2 50 p.m um it's why the national conversation is focused on people returning to work with no mention of when children can return to school and daycare. Because that is an implicit assumption. Yes, and return to golf. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, And and these are, this is pervasive. And um, it's why you're expected to go to a 5 p.m. meeting, right? And so you have this infinite ability to just be at work all the time because someone else is dealing with the mess at home. And the truth of the matter is we are trying to live in an equitable society where we all manage these things and we need structural support to do that. Um, and I think that the thin childcare system that exists in our country has been put together with glue and paper over the last 50 years as women have gone to work and it's operated on extremely thin margins, underpaid, undervalued childcare specialists. And um, it was never really designed to give us a successful launch into the workplace. Um, it evolved, but it was never designed. And I think the pandemic is unearthing that, that problem and will demand that we, we change it for the betterment of the people who work in those systems, for our children, and, th- and also for us. So I think that we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Lakshmi, any other discrepancies you want to highlight? Yeah, I think building off of the, the, the amazing constructs that you brought forth, Kelly, just wanted to add a couple of things, particularly in academic medicine, where your currency is your CV, your currency, your career advancement and promotion is so dependent on research productivity. I'm seeing so often that... Um, because of the lack of childcare, even senior physician scientists or senior researchers are totally unable to conduct research or prioritize their research productivity adequately. While I see male fa- faculty going into the office and taking their Zoom meetings from the office, and what's not pictured is their partner who is clearly at home raising their children while they're in the office cranking out papers. And 
Dr. Rishma Jogzi and colleagues have proven this phenomenon on publication bias, finding an effect of more first author and more senior author publications by men rather than women during the pandemic. And so I'm worried about the, and this has also been documented in multiple non-medical health professions as well. So I'm worried about the impact of the pandemic on research productivity. I'm also, like Kelly had said, very worried about burnout on women, particularly because, as you alluded to, the lack of boundaries. So like you said, the fact that our structure is already built to deliberately ignore some fundamental boundaries, like you said, with the parameters of the school day, we uh, at baseline are ignoring those boundaries and pretending that they don't exist. And, you know, I'm on calls with colleagues saying, my boss is making me take calls at 10.30 p.m. and I'm trying to put my toddler to bed while I'm literally on one ear with my boss. What's wrong with this picture? Hint, it's not the toddler's late bedtime, uh, <laughs> though that wouldn't work in our household. But I'm worried about the effects of burnout on women being exacerbated because at baseline, recent data have shown that women physicians are at more at a higher risk of burnout or at higher risk for suicide. And the societal expectations are crushing, as well as I think people's expectations of themselves and each other are, are more intense during the pandemic. So you talked about the breadwinner um, homemaker phenomenon, and now the breadwinner and the homemaker are also be are also expected to be the bread bakers and have a beautiful sourdough starter and have a multi-act play that your children are starring in and write that op-ed for the Washington Post, right? Because if you're not, what are you doing? You're slacking. And this is a toxic narrative that we are self-internalizing and propagating. And I'm especially worried, as Kelly said, about the impact on physician women of color who have multiple intersectional identities and I am so inspired by our women physician of color colleagues and also very sensitive to the minority tax at this time, which is this concept that in the times with the dual pandemics, as Kelly said, of both racism, police violence and coronavirus, women, physician of co- women physicians of color are being minority taxed more than ever, saying, with all these institutions saying we need to buff up our diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives, we need to host some town halls on racism, we need to draft some statements. I'm really concerned that women physicians of color are the ones being asked increasingly to step up to produce this content, to organize these events, to write these statements, and that's driving burnout even higher. Um, And so my message to everyone is that, and and I've been talking to everyone about this, to Shreya and Leah offline about this, is that We are enough and I see you and we are doing heroic things during this pandemic and we need to stop judging ourselves and treat ourselves with compassion and talk to ourselves as if we were talking to a colleague seeking advice and take active concrete steps to self-care, to delegating and sharing that mental load and to advocate for big structural change. You know, I... I, I also would just want to say, and this is something I see happen all the time with this minority tax that I, I try to educate my, the leadership and around me and, um, make this point. Um, when your institution wants to deal with racism and they are reacting to a public event, part of their, part of their ask can sometimes be, almost to save face, and it's done very quickly and in a very reactive way. And I would encourage leadership in institutions like hospitals and schools and and all of these places to just take a time out and take a moment and let these groups heal a bit. Um, And then think hard about asking them to be the ones on the panels and them to be the ones speaking about it, because you're you don't realize it, but you're actually burdening the people who are suffering by asking them to do those things. If they come forward, fine. But but you know this this practice of taking the the couple of you know minorities in your division and putting them in front of the problem is actually a really harmful practice. Um, you know it, they 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 speak about this in our racial equity training that we do it really being white allies and putting ourselves in front of the problem and naming our white privilege um, as the problem and talking about it with other white people rather than t- asking this group to sort of solve the problem for us um, in a superficial and very reactive way. 
Um, and I see people doing that unintentionally all the time. And I think right now we have to be really aware of that, um, that bias that lives in all of us. I would say though, and I, I was talking to Leah about this, I think offline is that one thing that I do want to be careful of is being sensitive to a minority tax and, and also not assuming to. And so that comes up in pregnancy a lot. And I'm thinking about our pregnant colleagues during this pandemic too. For example, uh, I have pregnant colleagues across the country during this pandemic who were just told by their chiefs, I've taken you off the service. Don't worry, you're good. And some of them are relieved and say, gosh, thank you. That's what I wanted and I was afraid to ask. And some of them are indignant saying, I want to work there. I, I've talked to my OB about the risk. And in my particular setting with protection, it's actually quite safe. And everyone's response is so individual. Everyone's risk is so individual that I would uh, caution everyone to, to not assume when making decisions for other people. I remember one of the my most respected faculty members and male allies who I adore during my late stages of pregnancy with my first child, looking at me, looking at my uterus and saying, I don't think the date of that talk is going to work for you. And, you know, he doesn't know the date. Does he know exact, does he know my exact due date? Does he know my exact plan? And uh, that was actually said out loud. Whereas more often than not, it's not said out loud. It's said outside the room that X, Y, and Z has so much on their plate. X, Y, and Z is going to go out and leave soon. And those decisions are made without either that woman or that woman of color or that underrepresented medicine physician actually saying, I do want to step back or I want to step up, count me in. And so I do caution people to, whether it's related to pregnancy or people from groups underrepresented medicine to just ask and listen and be respectful of the answer, whatever it is, and understand the factors that might go into that answer. Because assuming I've seen it go so wrong in so many ways, especially regarding pregnancy, and I'm seeing that during the pandemic come up over and over again, where people are, job responsibilities are being shifted without consent, really. I wanted to switch gears slightly, just take a brief interlude to see if we can come up with any silver linings to the changes in work during the pandemic. Uh, I read a Vox article today that President Obama tweeted out, and some of the, the silver linings in the Vox article were less consumerism, more focus on family, more flexible work. I had a difficult time seeing some of those in medicine um, because I feel like I have less, almost less time with my husband. And um, yeah, I, the flexible work is there, which I appreciate, but it's not, you know, we're not set up with our home, you know, our office, offices like we have at the office and things like that. It's not, it's not ideal. So I had a difficult time identifying and I wonder what the two of you have found to be as silver linings. I, I think that this question is hard to answer because we're, we're learning and living it as we speak. And it's, it might take a little bit longer in the, in the oven, so to speak, to, to really find out what those things are. But um, I am beginning to see some silver linings um, that I'm very hopeful about. Um, when I tell women or parents um, how I imagine them being successful, those hard-earned lessons that I had in those early years, it boils down to a couple of things, um, maybe a, just a very small list. The first is um, having control over your schedule. And not on necessarily your clinic days or the, the, the how many patients are coming. It's more about like what you're doing on which day um, is so important. Um, and in order to have control over your schedule, you really need institutional trust. You need to work for an institution that um, measures your success by your work output and not just when, you know, by FaceTime bias, by when, how often they see you in the office. Um, and so I think the pandemic has forced some of us in, in medicine into some of the 
operationalization of that, like what, how you, the how before the what, and I think we will come around to the what and the why. And so two things that I see that aren't going to go anywhere are, um, you know, telehealth and consolidating, consolidating telehealth into specific days in your schedule so that you can make the most out of either setting and limit exposure, you know, all of that. And um, video conferencing, which sounds like a no-brainer in some ways, but those two levers provide some essential things for working parents. They, they can eliminate a commute, which in Boston can sometimes be two hours a day, even if you, you're like me and you live six miles away from the hospital. Um, that is so important. Before the pandemic, my research days, I worked at home because I knew that that two hours was just too important to have for my productivity. And now every day is like that. And, it, you know, I'm filling that time with lesson planning for a homeschool. But you could imagine <laughs> that when that goes away, um, those two hours, that's a lot of time. Um, those days that they may consolidate uh, telehealth are days you can schedule dentist appointments for your kids or go to a baseball game, you know, that your son's in and um, provide you with a f- some flexibility. And And those video conferences um, allow you to take the early meeting at home, avoid the commute, leave a little bit later. You know, these tiny, tiny things on your institution's part make an enormous difference for an individual who's who's living this day-to-day struggle. Um, and I think we will notice that there's some wellness benefit to those things in, the, in that they won't go away because the patients won't want them to go away and because we won't want them to go away. And I think we can, if we leverage those things properly, there's a huge silver lining there. Um, the other thing that I tell people is that they um, really need to have um, – a work in progress in there with their partner around gender equity in the home. And um, this is obviously for heterosexual couples. Um, there's actually data that um, same-sex couples don't necessarily have the same struggles we do. Um, but starting that work now while you need to do it, because everybody's burning out and overloaded, starting to make those task lists or buy those cards uh, and and write down all the invisible things that you do so that you can divide and conquer better together. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes years in a marriage, I think, to do this properly. Um, but the important thing is that you're doing it and you're doing the work and you're getting a little bit better every year. It's not that you master it in, in, you know, over overnight. And so I think the pandemic has forced us to do that more with our partners and um, if we had some practical things to help, like those fair play cards, um, we use a Trello board at my house. Um, you know, I have a motto that you should run your, your family like a business so that you can keep your marriage, right? And you don't do things to your partner that you wouldn't do to your business partner. And so I think those are the big silver linings that I, that I see. And I'm really hoping FaceTime bias melts away a little bit because, um, we're not all there very much right now, but I think we're still doing incredible work at home. Totally agree, Kelly, uh, with the FaceTime bias that you've outlined. And I think hand in hand with that, I think a silver lining that I've seen is that it is giving permission to everyone. And we have to take that permission to be more clear and firm with our boundaries saying, no, I actually can't take meetings on Friday mornings because that is the day that I'm full time caregiver because there is no child care. Or that is the day that we are going to to an appointment together. And so previously, these kind of activities, uh, childcare or other caregiving responsibilities, were kind of done hush-hush on the margins. You might be ashamed to leave early to take care of that. And now there's this shared acknowledgement that we are all in this together. We're all in the same boat. And that if we own those boundaries and own that space, that you, other people respect that actually in the pandemic saying, oh, okay, sorry to hear that. You don't have child care. Let's try next week. <laughs> and so there is a little bit more forgiveness and permission and space for those boundaries. And I'm hopeful that that will continue long afterwards 
where we are not all viewed, like you said, Kelly, as workers to be judged by our scholarly outputs, but rather as whole people and with other identities and responsibilities and caregiving responsibilities. And I'm, I totally agree with you that I'm hopeful that this culture of FaceTime will diminish greatly in medicine. And the other silver lining I already said was the delivery ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So, I mean, some states after reopening are kind of already seeing a rise in cases, but I think um, there will be a second wave. And and when that happens, um, I'd love your guys' thoughts on what you would tell employers, what what you would tell women in medicine um, for the next time this kind of really – comes full force. I think there's that, there was that grim period like in April, May, where we, we all just like really felt it and it was full force. And when that happens again, um, what what would you kind of say for, for people to, to that we can do better? Yeah, I would I would say that um, what would be really meaningful is if institutions like hospitals, but this this is really beyond medicine, um, took a little bit of a time out um, and had some really ref- some reflective practice with um, the people that work for them, including faculty and staff, um, and really um, kind of had open dialogue about what the challenges were and um, didn't necessarily solve this, those challenges for us, but open up a dialogue and create some structures where we could collectively problem solve together. I think that would mean a lot as an employee. Um, it would mean a lot to be seen. I think a lot of us feel unseen right now when our institutions are silent about these issues. Um, and when you feel unseen, um, you feel invisible. And you most women translate that directly into shame. And um, shame that they're not doing enough, that they have this problem that they're alone with. Um, and um, so I think that would go a long way because I think we're just starting to do that as institutions. Um, so lift it, putting it, getting it out of the closet and putting some light on it, I think would mean a lot to me and to my colleagues. I know colleagues are already starting to like form uh, nanny shares um, with a, with a couple of other doctors, because if you find a nanny that's willing to work with a doctor, you know, and then they also want their children to socialize with other children because kids like really young children are not socializing as much as they need to right now. So I'm seeing that happen kind of organically, but I feel like it was a missed opportunity for the leadership to to sort of take that on um, or at least facilitate it. Um, I also think that we should kind of come up with like a pandemic response that you know, again, a a reflection, like what worked, what didn't work, how are we going to flip back into this, um, so that we all have clear expectations and aren't dealing with the unknown and anticipation, which is very uncomfortable. Um, And, you know, it's, it's, this is not a short term solution, but we need to start a conversation about on site or off site, you know, supported childcare options for essential workers. If you work, um, for a nursing home or you work for a hospital or you work for um, a grocery store, y- you need to know that you that there are these places you can send your children if 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 you run into a problem and it can be a small problem like a like a kid who's mildly ill but the d- the daycare won't accept them that day and but you still need to go to work. you know these things come up all the time for essential workers. they just don't come up and last for three months. Um, so I, I think that that conversation needs to begin. Some hospitals already do this, um, and it's wildly successful when they do, even if it's just an emergency daycare. It doesn't have to be a pan- like a panacea. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, that, that would be my short-term and long-term kind of ask. Um, I'm also thinking a lot about the staff. Our payment models in primary care are really, again, they're an evolution um, over years that many of us never chose, but um, our staff can't create value in the work they do unless they're doing it in person. 
so that when we have them work virtually, they, they don't generate any revenue. And so they are the first to get furloughed. And that has incredible impact on them financially. And I think we need to think about the colleagues around us who support us and more equitable structures so that they can be, and we need them. Like I need a virtual medical assistant. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but <laughs> me running a telehealth clinic on my own is like watching my grandmother try to like, you know, uh, <laughs> it's like, awful. Oh my God. It's so, you know, we need them um, and they need us. And so um, let's not let a, an outdated, archaic payment model stop them from doing good work. Um, and so I would extend our, our imaginations beyond ourselves as faculty into some very vulnerable people that support us. Totally agree. Essential workers don't want only that eight o'clock applause every day, right? Essential workers want job protection so much more job protection, job security, not pay cuts. Hiring freezes are a big problem now. Again, that's going to be disproportionately affecting women, all of these issues. And I totally agree with you, Kelly, that the big elephant in the room is childcare and other caregiving responsibilities. How can we be more nimble next time to predict this? And I would also add with that, how can we be more equitable too? So that it's not that the women clinical faculty are filling these extra attending shifts and senior faculty are writing more papers. How can we make that more equitable? How can we co-create, as Kelly was talking about, models that are equitable and just and fair? And I think it goes back to my earlier comment of not assuming the impact of COVID on each different population whether that's a pregnant colleague or trainees in my role working with trainees, often during this pandemic, we've assumed, oh, the trainees, they, they don't want to be involved with the COVID patients. Let's protect them completely. And then when you listen and hear, they actually want adequate PPE. They want not to feel coerced. It's not simple black and white that they don't want to take care of COVID patients. And again, in some cities, there's not that choice. There's not the luxury of having the choice, but it's very simplistic to make a policy that affects everyone. And we have to be sensitive and not assume that that policy will land equitably on very different populations. So th that's the type of things that I would add to Kelly's comments about thinking employers thinking big and also think small in terms of the impact of each and every person that you're thinking about and know that that impact is felt differently and that we don't know what other responsibilities they have or what's going on at home. And you can't assume that the person without kids is going to be able to take up extra shifts. That's a form of inequity that I see as well. It's people saying things like, well, that person is single. They can step up and take more shifts. That's inappropriate. And you don't know what that person is dealing with, a personal health condition, their partner's health condition, or personal fear of not wanting to work with COVID patients. So we have to acknowledge that everyone is dealing with different responsibilities and how do we respect people's boundaries and responsibilities and do that in an equitable and fair way. The first step is to just ask and listen and not assume. And I'll also say a huge silver lining. I mean, this came up at graduation today. Um, you know, a pandemic is an awful, awful thing. Um, but it's also an incredible opportunity for a trainee, for a practicing physician to observe um, something that you can't really teach in a book. Um, and all the things we're talking about right now, it, there's like a rush of perspective and reflection that's happening for everybody right now. And I, I actually think, you know, I told the graduates today that, you know, if you talk to somebody who trained during the HIV pandemic, they, you will, no matter what their specialty, that marked them for eternity and it completely shaped their identity as physician identities as physicians in positive ways. Um, it, it created an entire specialty in primary care of HIV primary care. It, it, it brought dermatologists and oncologists and internists together in a way that, you know, was so meaning there's so much that will come from this that will make them better doctors. And I also think that, we are, go we are also having to face the, the latent problem in our system that we value, 
you know, expensive pharmaceuticals and procedures and really exciting acute inpatient care. Um, and we built our system around hospitals to provide acute ca expensive care. And that is low value care on a global level. Um, and we devalue public health and we devalue all these systems that care for populations. And I feel that in my specialty all the time. Um, and so we were woefully unprepared to, to deal with this as it was coming at us from, from abroad because of those issues. Um, we were really good at treating ARDS and, um, you know, figuring out that people needed anticoagulation, but we were very bad at putting up a defense to the wave that was coming at us. Um, and we're going to need to look at that as a society and make some decisions about it. Um, and I, I feel like we needed a, something like this to have that conversation. Yeah. And kind of continuing on thinking about ending on an inspiring note, every hospital and in, in institution is in a different place financially with different circumstances. And it's just amplifying positive um, things we've heard. Uh, one, one colleague um, actually at Cornell, I just wanted to uh, texted me earlier today and just, I don't know how they were able to do this in New York City madness, but um, at least for all their pregnant women or anyone else who didn't feel comfortable with their hospital medicine shifts, because the whole hospital was COVID and um, they were able to have them be virtual hospitalists and actually get compensated for it. I don't think it was the full compensation for a hospitalist shift, but it was somewhere around two thirds or more. And I just thought it was really, um, really great to see that flexibility. I don't, again, don't know the details of how it happened. And I'm sure our Evans or someone was really advocating and um, made it work. But, um, but I, I just yeah, go I for it, Leah. Out of the box solutions for this next wave, should it come. I love that innovation, that spirit of innovation. Yeah. That thing. I was like virtual hospitalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's amazing. What's and that? I think that oh, when I great. see that, you know, hospitals, like Kelly says, we're all just taking it one day at a time. I would say that I'm very grateful to our institution, UCSF, for continuing our childcare during the pandemic, since that has been instrumental to me personally and my colleagues. But I see um, innovation occurring in the pandemic outside of hospital walls, outside of institutional walls. And I think one example that I was talking about with Shreya is that the Women in Medicine Summit and Med Twitter actually came together with some leading voices to come up with this, con this concept of COVID contributions on the CV. And I thought that was a innovative and practical and concrete framework to just capture all the work that we're doing, all the unpaid labors of love that we're doing and write it down and catalog it and systematize it and put it in a format that's easy to understand so that when next year's reckoning for advancement and promotion comes, you'll be ready saying that not only did I partially homeschool two children every single day for four months, and I also did these things, and this grant was halted because the lab was closed for two months, where you can really say concretely what activities were newly started, volunteer activities, PPE drives, media interviews, podcasts, blogs, <laughs> um, what activities were paused, and what are other caregiving responsibilities or otherwise did you deal with during this time in addition? And so I love that innovations like that are coming up outside of certain institutions walls, but really with the medical community coming together and saying, we need a way to capture all this and write it down in a way that these committees are going to understand it a year from now when hopefully these pressures are a distant memory. Yeah. We'll definitely link that in our show notes. I think that that was by uh, Vinny Aurora, um, Charlie Ray, Avio Glasser, Mark Shapiro, and a bunch of a, bu a bunch of good people on Twitter. Awesome. Well, we should maybe we should wrap up. I think it's going to be hard to pick key points because pretty much every moment of this podcast was a pearl. I learned so much. But could you each uh, give us maybe two or three take home points for the listeners that you don't want us to forget? Um, I would say that if you feel like you are spiraling down as you progress during those tender years of mid-career or early career, starting your family, 
Um, we know there's a there's like an assistant professor slump that happens. Um, if you find that happening to you, um, <laughs> you should really evaluate. Um, take a step back and think: Is it me, or is it is it the path I'm I'm on? And how can I how can I make a path that works for me and enables me? Um, and um, I would say that promotion committees and promotion tracks are pretty um, pretty um, obvious examples of structural bias that still exist in the in the um, system. They need to change. But in the meantime, you should you should do what you love. You should follow your heart. You should make your next decision the thing that makes you happy and brings you joy in your work. And the end product will be worth its weight in gold, even if it looks atypical and even if the path winds a lot. I would just also say to remember that the things you need to succeed are institutional support, flexibility in your schedule, and control over your schedule, and um, gender equity at home. Thanks, Kelly. I, I totally agree that there are individual things that we can do, and there are structural things that we must work to change. From the individual perspectives, I'll go back to my three Ps, your partners, your patients, and your panels. What can you do for each of those angles, both individually and structurally, to advocate to make it a better situation? For your partnerships, you can go buy that fair play book or the cards or run the list with your partner and say, what can I delegate to you? What can I hand off to you? What is too much? And I really appreciate you for all that you're doing. And for your patients, how can we think at a, at a structural level, at a service level, an institutional level, how to make things equitable? And let's do that by not assuming what different groups want. And from a panel level, from a service level, I agree with Kelly that this service, these unpaid labors of love, the COVID clinic, this podcast, all of these things are going to be tiny little lines on the CV, and I don't care. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I love, and this is what is giving me joy. And so I encourage you all to do that. And I think this concept of essential workers has also forced us to look inside and say, what is essential actually in my week? What can I strip away? What can I focus on for my own well-being and happiness during this tumultuous time? Thanks so much to you both. I really appreciate it. This has been great. Yeah, this was really great, guys. I feel like I'm going to listen to this a couple times to really like let it sink in. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Mm. <laughs> that was a very sweet, sweet. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you can find our show notes along with links to any articles, books, websites, or apps mentioned on the show at thecurbsiders.com backslash podcast. You can also sign up to receive our weekly mailing list with a PDF copy of our expertly done show notes at thecurbsiders.com backslash knowledge food. We are committed to bringing you high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your input. So subscribe, rate, review. You, uh, the show on Apple Podcasts and send us email at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. You can recommend a future topic or tell us what you love or hate about the show. And finally, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Shreya Trivedi. And I've been Dr. Leo Witt. And this has been Dr. Justin Burke. Thanks to all of our producers for this episode, Sarah Phoebe Roberts, Hannah Abrams, Nora Toronto, Molly Hubline, Beth Garbatelli, and to our whole Curbsiders team who keeps the show running. Beth Garbs Garbatelli runs our Twitter. Maddie Mad Dog Morgan is on Instagram. And Chris the Chew Man Chew is on Facebook. Thank you and good night. And thanks to our partner, VCU Health Continuing Education, who's helping us offer free CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information.